So this is probably gonna be the last time the background is gonna look like this. <laughs> I mean, the pictures are gonna stay right where they are, where they are but this is all gonna probably change along my mantle um, because I'm decorating for Christmas today. And I'm making it a video, so tune in on Thursday to see all the different things I'm gonna do to make my place a little more of a winter wonderland. Kind of like it looks like outside because it snowed in Minnesota. Let's just get started talking about Beast Morphers. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. I am Britt, and if you haven't subscribed yet, you probably should because I, I talk about geeky things. And on Mondays, we talk about Power Rangers Beast Morphers because I'm 33 and it's okay to like Power Rangers in your 30s. And I don't say that sarcastically or embarrassed. Um, I say that out of just my honest to God, honest truth that the people who are watching Power Rangers are my age. And I am making these videos specifically for the people my age. So if you're a kid, hey, go enjoy Power Rangers. Don't watch my videos because I'm probably going to make you cry. But I, these videos are meant to be talking to the 30-something-year-olds, uh, the 20-something-year-olds, the 40-something-year-olds that still watch Power Rangers like me, and uh, for us to talk a little more educatedly, a little more intelligently about the show. Like always, if you guys don't want to watch the entire episode recap, go ahead and click this timestamp below. I have been missing that the last couple of weeks, so I apologize. I do throw it in there still in editing. Um, but yeah, if you guys don't want to watch that, just want to jump to my thoughts on the episode, go ahead and hit that one. This might be a long one. This was the season finale of season one. So we've got a lot to talk about. So the next one and the final one until Beast Morphers comes back uh, will be the Christmas episode. So let's just jump into this episode. So we open up on the majority of the Power Rangers, Devin not included in this particular scene, watching the Rangers essentially steal stuff for Evox, steal those transporters for Evox, because obviously last episode they changed the course of time in people's heads to believe that Blaze and Roxy became the Red and Yellow Ranger like they were intended to from the very beginning. So of course they were going to believe them. Um, everyone was obviously disappointed with themselves for believing this, but obviously like it was a spell kind of situation and you really can't blame yourself for a spell, but people do. And we, we people have since Tommy became the good Green Ranger instead of the evil Green Ranger. So we've been doing that for a very long time. It's very, very normal for us. During this scene, Roxy's pod begins to blink. Um, so obviously people start freaking out. And we already knew that there was something going on with Roxy's pod. And so they all run over there. And it turns out that the life support was essentially uh, compromised, meaning that Roxy was on the verge of dying at this point. And this was obviously scary for Ravi. This is scary for everybody, but especially Ravi, because obviously Roxy is the love of his life. They come to the conclusion that if they defeat her avatar, that she should essentially wake up. But at this point is either wake Roxy up or Roxy's going to die. And so Ravi kind of puts it in his head that the main prerogative is going to be to destroy Roxy's avatar. We're gonna talk about that later. Power Ranger like expert over here, okay? But of course the commander kind of brings them back to reality and saying that the transporters need to be the top priority because if the if Evox uses the transporters, he can do a lot of different things, as we clearly see at the end of this episode. So, you know, Robbie should have kept his head in the game, maybe, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. So like normal, we all, we have Ben and Betty adding laughs, laughs to the episode, but they actually are able to add to this episode by finding a van full of transporters. They should have just been in the same vehicle that they were in last week, but they weren't. So, you know, Evox's people are out there stealing vans too, I guess. I don't know. They actually find the transporters. They are then chased away by the pawns. What are they called? I don't remember the names of pawns generally, except for the ones through the Zordon era. Those are literally the only ones that I actually care about. I literally just finished watching RPM last night and I don't remember what their pawns are called. <laughs> Devin was missing from the first scene because he was actually at a rally to get his father re-elected as mayor. So he's sitting on stage and being paged on his wrist comp by the commander saying, hey, go help the others fight because the others are out fighting. Uh, so go help the others fight. And uh, he obviously can't until the rally is attacked and Devin runs off. His father sees him running off and gets upset that his son is running off from danger, is running away from the danger, instead of sticking around and helping uh, fight. When, you know, it should have been just up to the Rangers to do that, which of course, Devin was not really running away. Devin was running somewhere where he could 
successfully morph in secret. Uh, it's the first time I've ever seen them care about morphing or unmorphing in secret, but you know. Ben and Betty catch up with the rangers as they are fighting and tells them where the transporters are. So the rangers go off to get the transporters. Grazel is told to send a gigger down, down to Earth to try and keep the rangers busy while they get the transporters to the places that they need to be in order to do what needs to be done, which is of course take more and more effects so that Evox can get into his own body. Can you guess how the season's ending? When the rangers are informed that the Giga Drone is there and that they need to go fight the Giga Drone, Ravi is instructed to take the van and not stop, focus only on getting the transporters back to the base and the others can go and fight in the Zords. So Ravi gets into the van and starts driving off. Roxy finds this perfect opportunity to distract him, knowing how he feels about Roxy and so she jumps in front of the van and then runs off. Ravi has this m battle in his mind about what he needs to be doing right now. He hears you know his mom in his head saying that the transporters need to be the first priority but he also hears Nate in his head saying that she either needs to wake up or die essentially and so he decides to go after Roxy to defeat the avatar once and for all. During this fight with the avatar of Roxy which I'm going to start saying the avatar of Roxy in this in this moment because obviously we have two Roxy's in this episode. So Ravi's fight with the avatar Roxy um, he manages to get a hand handle on her morpher and destroys it. She would could no longer tell teleport away, couldn't run away from this fight. And Ravi does successfully destroy Roxy's avatar in this scene. The other rangers in their zords are able to also take down the Giga Drone, which of course is great because that means that the city is safe, right? Well, no, because when Ravi turns around, he sees Blaze in the van taking the transporters away, which obviously is not good news. Blaze takes them and hides them where he needs to hide them in specific places so that they can take the Morphex, can take the tower, can take the Morphex tower. And, you know, Ravi gets back to the base and finds out that Roxy is not actually waking up and that she's getting worse. Uh, which, of course, the commander is very angry that he took it upon himself to go and stop Roxy when he shouldn't have. Listen to his mommy, okay? Just listen to your mommy, Ravi. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence with this decision only just because, obviously, you want to save, you want to sacrifice the few f to, you know, save many. What's that actual saying? Anyway, there's an actual saying. Um, but... At the same time, like, I also feel like it's really cold to be like, eh, screw that person. We got to go save other people. So, like, I'm definitely on the fence where that's concerned, like, ethically. It's it's like the trolley problem. Do you kill the one person or do you kill the five? Which way do you tell the, the trolley to go when you have to kill somebody? Which one do you do? And Ravi decided to sacrifice the many to save the few. You know, so like I said, I mean, it's, it's an ethical battle. It's an actual ethical thought problem so you know see the good place watch the good place ben and betty are actually able to add to the story once again they find a transporter again and they tell the rangers where to go so the rangers go and they're trying to figure out how to get it out of there and how to that they have to find the others and everything like that and this is when devin's dad approaches devin to you know tell him off for running away from danger and so he does that and tells Devin that he's very disappointed in his son, that, you know, his son is out, isn't out there trying to find a job. His son isn't out there doing, you know, good things. He is, you know, only just thinking about himself and coming back with bumps and bruises like he's been fighting and blah, 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 blah. Why are you not more successful? This one became very obvious to me as to what was going to happen, but uh, it, I actually knew kind of from the beginning, but we're going to talk about that in a second. Then Blaze attacks and the Rangers have to go off and fight Blaze and uh, their pawns. And so then Devin's dad decides to save Ben and Betty as they're trying to get the transporter out of there. And this just becomes kind of this big epic battle where, De where Blaze is able to get the transporter back once again and fight Devin and make Devin unmorph in front of, in front of his father. Um, revealing his identity to his father, uh, which I think will be very interesting in the final season, or the second season, final season of Power Rangers Beast Morpher. So I'm excited to see season two at this point for that purpose. Um, and a couple of other things, obviously, Jason. This episode has a very big ending, very big ending, but it's the season finale, so it should have a very big ending. Blaze is able to put the transporter back into its proper location in order to take the tower, and he takes the tower and Devin along with it. So we have now lost our Red Ranger 
in the season finale. Uh, this is not something that happens. We lose our Red Ranger sometimes. Like our Red Red Ranger, our Red Ranger does get captured. I mean, Jason got captured by Tommy. Our Red Ranger does get captured. Troy got captured at some point as well in Megaforce, uh, Super Megaforce. I don't count the supers. It's just season one and season two. But he got captured in Megaforce, so we lose our Red Rangers. Our Red Rangers do get kidnapped, so it's not like it's out of the ordinary. But this is, I think, the first time it was a season finale. So that's exciting to wait for in the next season, which I don't know when that season's supposed to start airing. I have to look that up. So the Rangers are back at the base trying to figure out what they're gonna do to save Devin. Uh, they are putting together this gateway that they had destroyed. They're gonna try and put this gateway together to try and just storm Evox's lair to try and save them. This is when Roxy's tube, Roxy's pod begins to blink again and they go running over to see what's happening and fearing the worst, but it actually means that Roxy's waking up. And Roxy wakes up and tells them with inner cutting of what's actually happening in front of Devin in Evox's lair, but tells them that the whole plan is to give Evox this new body. And if they can, if he can do, if they can successfully do that, then Evox will destroy everything. Yeah, that's how they ended the season. So now we get to watch the Christmas episode as if that didn't happen. <laughs> Because if you guys don't know, the Christmas episode, which will be at the end of the season, uh, it just takes place sometime during the season or maybe even alternatively from the season. I don't know. I'm going to be less excited about the Christmas episode now that that happened because I just want more see I just want more of this story and I just want Jason. So there you go. Let's talk about how I feel about this particular episode. As you guys can probably tell, I've been enjoying this episode. This episode was actually quite enjoyable for me um, as a filmmaker specifically, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Now. Uh, but yeah, so some of the things I liked about this particular episode, I actually liked seeing that Ben and Betty actually were adding to the story because uh, they never do. So I know I've talked about in the past the whole notion of kind of this A story, B story, C story, and that Power Rangers kind of does like an A and a B story because they don't go as com they don't go as complicated all the time as a C story. Um, but Ben and Betty will generally add to the B story, that underlying story, that secondary story, that story that nobody really cares about. And Power Rangers, it in Power Rangers it tends to be the story where the kids are learning a lesson from. Whereas with, um, you know, the A story, it's the actual fight. It's the actual like building up to what this episode, what this season is going to be. So there's that. Um, so it was really nice to see Ben and Betty actually adding to the story. As much as I don't like the characters, um, I feel like it was really nice just to see that. So I'm happy to see that. Anyway, yeah. So Ben and Betty added to the story. Congratulations. So I um, just told the future again about Power Rangers and it's no big deal, you guys. It's no big deal at all. Um, so uh, yeah. I either know way too much about Power Rangers and can tell their formulas like that, or Beast Morphers is just incredibly predictable, or I'm actually psychic, one of those one of those two. But this is the second time now in Beast Morphers that I have told the legitimate, like the legitimate future, and there's a whole slew of stories that I have about telling the future in Power Rangers before. My favorite being, of course, that I've already talked about multiple times is that Jason came back as the Gold Ranger and I called it before the first movie came out. Um, but yeah, if you guys want me to do an, a video where I talk specifically about the times that I've told the future in Power Rangers, please let me know because I would love to sit down and talk about those in detail. And I mind you, like I didn't, I stayed away from spoilers. I stay away from spoilers, as far away from spoilers as I can possibly stay. And I still was able to tell the future, so. There you go. So I told the future again. Uh, at the beginning of the season, I outright said Nate was gonna become a Power Ranger and he's the Gold Ranger. Uh, and then this one, a few weeks ago, I remember saying that I felt like Roxy was gonna be the first one to be saved between Blaze and Roxy. And guess who was right once again? Uh, didn't think it was actually gonna happen this season, but I was very convinced that Roxy was gonna be the first one to be saved. Um, and that is very exciting and I'm very excited to see Liana kind of pull out a different version of Roxy now. It'll really be an, a, a, a good indicator of what kind of actress she really honestly is because it's the first time I've seen her in anything. So it'll be interesting to see in season two this good version of Roxy or is she going to stay good? Because uh, that has run through my mind too that because she does have the memories of evil Roxy, does that mean she's all good? Or does that mean that she's still slightly evil? Only time will tell what's gonna happen with Roxy moving forward at this point, but it's gonna be very interesting to see Liana do with this character what uh, 
what she does because I, I do have faith. She's kind of a standard actress in this and I'm very excited to see what she does with this character moving forward. So there you go. Um, I really, I'm gonna have to charge this camera now. I also really liked the darkness that uh, was involved with this particular episode. Uh, and this is coming from somebody who just finished watching RPM last night. Uh, when I talk about darkness, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty picky because RPM is one of my favorite seasons, is my second favorite season technically, but it's a very, very close second to Power Rangers in space. Um, but what I mean by the darkness in this episode is we're actually talking about death in this episode, which is not unusual for, for Power Rangers, but also unusual for Power Rangers. It kind of depends on the time frame that we are talking about with Power Rangers. Disney never really shied away from the concept of death, really. Um, and I don't think death should be something that is censored from children. I mean, I experienced death very early in my life um, with I had my grandfather, my dad's dad die, and my aunt, who was only 26, die very early in life. And I feel like it would have been comforting to have television shows talk about those kinds of things and have that fear and have that kind of in there and talking about it. Um, so no, I, I think that that's definitely something that should be talked about. And I'm very glad that this did not shy away from that, that this did state kind of uh, a finalization for the character of Roxy, even though she doesn't die, um, but at the same time, it would have been a very interesting kind of finalization for the character. At the same time, um, I like it because of the fact that it adds a little bit of juiciness to the story as well. I mean, one thing that drives me crazy with kids television shows specifically is that there is no real true motivation with the characters because there's nothing at stake. There's nothing huge at stake. I mean, you look at something like an anime like Yu-Gi-Oh, for example, which mind you, I like Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, I haven't watched it in a very, very long time, so I don't know how I feel about it now. But when I did watch it, I really liked it. But at the same time, like there was nothing really at stake. It was a children's card game. Yes, souls were at stake. But at the same time, like, I don't know, like there just wasn't enough at stake to really make it that dramatic, as dramatic as it honestly was. Uh, now season zero, that's a whole different story, but we're talking about the stuff that aired in America legally, so. But yeah, so uh, the darkness, I think, of the death of, or the, the imminent, the eminent death of Roxy, not the actual death, because it didn't happen, but the eminent death of Roxy, I think, was a very cool, way to go about it and it made the story a little bit darker gave the, the characters motivations that they wouldn't normally have had or that they shouldn't have normally have had um of course we know that's not always the case with beast morphers they the motivations are always weird but it does kind of corrupt their motivation it does change their motivation quite a bit especially with ravi when we had ravi kind of deciding what made better sense does he go save the love of his life or does he save the town? And of course we know that he decided to save the love of his life, but did that make that decision a good decision or a poor decision? Because of that decision, the Morphex Tower is gone and so is Devin. And had he just gone to the base with the transporter, that probably wouldn't have happened or at least happened as easily as it did. So it, it, it really leads to good storytelling where that's concerned. Um, another aspect that I really did, did enjoy, uh, mostly, there's one part and we'll get to it after I'm done talking about this, was the whole Devin's dad, Devin storyline, which of course is that Devin's dad finds out that he's a Power Ranger. Now, mind you, I could add this to the list of things that I, that I told the future for, um, I just didn't. I just knew it at the beginning of the episode. I didn't, it's not in a video somewhere. But at the beginning of this episode, when we have Devin's dad kind of prominent in the episode, I'm like, oh, he's just gonna find out he's a Power Ranger. But the reason I'm not adding that on there is because I always think that. <laughs> um, anytime a parent is like prominently in an episode, I'm like, oh, the parent's gonna find out that the, their kid's a Power Ranger. And there's really no reason for that because it's not like that is a, a, a trope or a formula of Power Rangers, but at the same time, like that's just always something that's in my head. But what I like is the fact that they followed the, the same formula that they have always kind of followed with a few exceptions. Um, obviously like Mystic Force, when there was this really, when there was this reveal of who the Power Rangers were in Mystic Force, it was a little different where this was concerned. They didn't follow this formula, it was a little different, but it wasn't like a huge difference. I think Disney kind of did its own thing. They, they set up their own formulas and I would love to sit down and talk about the formulas of Power Rangers and kind of talk about each season um, and how their formula works and which seasons followed which formulas and blah, 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 all that stuff. But Disney kind of had its own little formula. But with Disney, we also didn't have nearly as many reveals of who the Power Rangers were. Um, we had it in Dino Thunder, we had it in Mystic Force, 
we did not have it really in any other season that I can think of. We had other different kinds of reveals, but reveals just are a part of television story. It's about, it's about telling long form stories. You know, so it's one thing that we faced with Saban a lot was the reveal of who the Power Rangers really were or needing to keep their identity secret. And one thing that I've always noticed with Power Rangers in their reveal is that there's this moment of this high speed, high paced, story. So it's usually in the middle of a fight or it's in the middle of something just fast paced happening. Lots of beating music, lots of intense, just like follow music, like just this um, kind of edge of your seat, your heart is pumping kind of music. And they do that. I mean, that's one thing that I love about filmmaking. <laughs> filmmakers have it so easy. We have it so easy. And mind you, when I talk about filmmakers, I talk about anybody that has a camera that tells a narrative story. So that can be new media that can be feature length film that can be short film that can be um you know television shows anybody with a camera that tells a narrative is a filmmaker regardless of whether it is short form long form or actually like film like movies so filmmakers have it so easy we can tell a story in so many different ways and we can manipulate our audience into feeling what we want them to feel without them even knowing it like I can manipulate people into believing whatever I want with just camera angles, lighting, and music. And it's a beautiful thing. It's so easy. Writers have it so much harder to elicit emotion with the flow of their words because um, they don't have music. They don't have framing. They don't have, you know, lights. They don't have all these different things. They have to explain them and they have to use their words and they have to, you know, flow their words perfectly to elicit these emotions. Writing is a lot harder than filmmaking <laughs> to do what, what, to elicit that emotion. But yeah, so I think that filmmakers have it so easy and this is one thing that I love about it. And this was something that just as a filmmaker warmed my heart because I felt like it was executed so beautifully was a scene where Devin's dad found out that Devin was a Power Ranger. Um, but like I said, you know, we, we have all this fast paced, fast music, um, just this, this kind of edge of your seat moment. And then there's this moment of stillness. Go back and watch episodes where the Rangers identities were revealed, whether it is to Adam, Rocky, Aisha, or to an entire world. Go and watch those reveal episodes and tell me that I'm wrong, that it follows that same formula of this really fast paced moment. And then this moment of stillness when the Rangers are revealed or reveal themselves. And then there's this moment of just wonder. And usually it's quiet, usually it's silent, usually there is no music. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, but I just feel like this episode did it so beautifully that they followed that formula so well. I mean, it's like Chip Lynn has been part of Power Rangers for forever, <laughs> which of course he has. He was there for first Saban, he was there for some of Disney. I mean, he did RPM for God's sakes. I don't know what happened to him. Cause he did RPM. Like, we know you have it in you, Chip. We know you have it in you. And then he did some, even Neo Saban. Uh, and then of course now he's doing this one. So he's been there for forever. And so obviously he knows the formulas that has been told back when, when Tony Oliver was the head writer and showrunner. Um, you know, obviously they had, he was there. He was able to, you know, pinpoint all of these different things that Tony had done in the writing room with the writers when he was just a writer for the show. He was able to formulate that in this episode, him and his team were able to formulate that very beautifully. I mean, I still think that he's a crappy showrunner because something happened to him between RPM and now because they are very starkly different. The last 10 years of his life, he must have just lost all creative ability, most creative ability, because I just finished watching RPM and I saw his name and I wanted to punch the screen because of how he's what he's turned Power Rangers into lately. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a Nickelodeon thing, but either way, Hasbro, call me because I will be a better showrunner. I'll make it more like what Chip Lynn did 10 years ago, okay? But yeah, so I mean, I felt like that scene was just done very beautifully and done very, very well. So those are things that I really like about this episode. Now, what are the things I didn't like? Devin's dad. Um, I felt like his story was told very poorly. Um, you know, obviously we had it set as he wants to be re elected as the mayor and then he gets mad at Devin for running away. But then when he confronts Devin about it, then when the attack happens again, he tells Devin to go. So like there was just this weird, like what direction do you want to go with him kind of thing? 
Um, I just felt like his dad was very unlikable in this episode, and I don't want to dislike the characters, especially if they're going to find out that the Rangers, who, who the Rangers are. You know, I don't like disliking the civilians. I don't like when the civilians are people that I kind of look at and go, oh, this person again. I'm just not a big fan of that, and I felt like his character was not executed very, very well in this episode. I felt like it, was, it could have been executed much better. Um, and then just the easy writing. Like I've talked about many times in this particular uh, round of videos where I've been talking about these episodes. I, I hate the easy writings. I talked about it last week when Devin didn't realize he was a Power Ranger, gave his morpher to Ben and Betty. Steel didn't want to, but they got it anyway. And then Devin realizes he's a Power Ranger, so he uses his cheetah powers to just go and take the morpher, the, not morpher, but the communicator, the wrist comm back. You know, it was, there was no difficulty in that. But when Ben and Betty load the transporter into the truck, and then, De and then Blaze is so like able to just steal it so very easily. Like, I just felt like there was just, it was like, the writers were like, okay, well we need this to happen, this to happen, and this to happen, so what do we do? Oh, we just do it. We don't need a story behind it, we just do it. You know what I mean? It's just, I just don't like when they take the easy way out. Like, add decent execution, add decent exposition to your story. It's not that difficult. There could have been so much more deepness that they could have done, especially since this episode did get so deep. And this whole storyline so far has been pretty intricate, which we're going to talk about next Monday. We're going to talk about the, the Christmas episode, but then the following Monday, I'm going to do kind of a full recap on how I feel about the entire season as a whole. So we're going to talk more about that when I do that video. But at the same time, like, I just, I don't know. I feel... <laughs> I feel cheated whenever there's that kind of writing in there where it feels like the writers are like, well, we need to do this thing, so let's just do it. Let's just put the character there. Or let's just put them in that situation. Like, we can just put them there. Like, we have that ability. Uh, don't go read my fan fictions from high school because I did that a lot. But I was also a child. I was also not keen in storytelling and I did not I hadn't studied filmmaking yet. I hadn't studied film in college yet. So keep that in mind if you ever do find my old fan fiction dot net account uh, where I did that all the time and I stopped writing fan fiction around the time that I was in college so anyway yeah so that is uh, that is how I felt about this episode of Beast Morphers I hope you guys enjoyed it I enjoyed this episode and this season has been kind of up and down I I really I talk about a lot where I felt like a lot of the episodes you know the the, the opportunities were here the 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 expectation was here and it just kept like missing it but I felt like this one really matched its potential and it really uh, made me feel good and made me feel like maybe season two will be better and Jason's coming back in season two I, I don't know if it's just for the last couple of episodes or if it's somewhere in the middle or if he's in it for a decent por por portion of the show it'll be interesting to see what happens and when he shows up and why he shows up and what he's there to do um, obviously the very end of this episode they talk about how this could affect the Morphin grid um, completely which of course Jason has a huge role in um, having started the whole Power Rangers franchise, whole Power Rangers legacy here on Earth. And so it'd be interesting to see what comes of season two. I'm very excited to see it, even though my expectations have been lowered quite a bit, um, just because of how this season went with its potential and missing it constantly. But like I said, we're going to talk more about how I felt about the whole season as a whole in a little while, um, in a couple of weeks. But that's how I felt about this episode of Power Rangers Beast Morphers. Let me know in the comments below what you guys felt about this episode of Power Rangers Beast Morphers and what you guys thought about the whole season as a whole. Um, and we're going to talk about that. And uh, we're going to have a good little break here coming up on my Monday videos. Uh, let me know if you're sad that I'm not going to be making videos on Monday after two weeks. But uh, trust me, it'll be a lot easier for me. <laughs> I'll see you guys all next week. Or actually on Thursday. When you guys get to see me put together my Christmas wonderland here. Uh, which I'm still building. So anyway, I'll see you guys all next time. Bye. Do you like sleeping in my clean clothes? At least my clean clothes, not my dirty clothes. Weird cat. Weird cat, are you sleeping? Weird cat, wake up. Nova! Hi! She's like, what? I was taking a nap. You're so mean to me, mom. Worst mom ever. Side note, I found a mouse trap under my like stove thing that's inserted into my fireplace. I don't know if there's a dead mouse down there or not. So that's interesting news.